On this Monday night, a new plane load of Canadians returning from China. Another flight on its way to CFB Trenton, plus China's mission to disinfect and protect. And the UK's new plan to stop the coronavirus from spreading there. Intensifying anger. No! More pipelines! I'm so afraid of land! And more arrests. In the fight against a pipeline. The Democrats who want to defeat Donald Trump get ready to duke it out again. Our Jackson Prosco is in New Hampshire tonight. Plus, the push to change the Oscars, same old script. Parasite. As a non-English film repeatedly pushes the envelope. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Another plane carrying Canadians out of the heart of the new coronavirus outbreak has taken off from China. Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister says the second chartered plane has left Wuhan. It is en route for CFB Trenton with a refueling stop in Vancouver. Passengers will join hundreds of other evacuees already under quarantine. Meanwhile, the cases keep multiplying on board the Diamond Princess cruise ship. More than 2,500 passengers remain under quarantine in the port of Yokohama, Japan. The ship's owner says 66 more people are now confirmed to have the virus, including one more Canadian. That nearly doubles the total number of cases to 136. The vast majority of the cases, though, are still in China. Officials there say there were 108 deaths in the past day. That's the highest in a single day. And it brings the overall death toll to over 1,000. That means this new coronavirus has killed more people than SARS. And the outbreak is still spreading. Chinese media is reporting there are now more than 43,000 cases worldwide, most of them in China. These pictures of mass disinfection have emerged from Hubei province. That's where the outbreak began, and it's where most illnesses and deaths are occurring. This video was released by state media. It's not clear what is being sprayed or what impact it might have. Crews are reportedly targeting cities across Hubei province and will spray disinfectant twice a day. We'll have more on the efforts to contain the outbreak in China in just a moment. But first, to the latest on those Canadians stranded on cruise ships. Mike Lecouture has tonight's top story. An eighth Canadian who is on this cruise ship has contracted the new coronavirus. Global Affairs Canada says the person is now in a Yokohama hospital, while 254 other Canadians on board that boat remain in quarantine. Well, um, I'm a little frustrated. Including Greg Yerricks, who says he's lucky to have this balcony view, even though it's of the port. And he's just happy to ride out the quarantine on the ship. The Canadian government going to send a plane and take us all home and still go through this in Trenton? Well, we'd be on Canadian soil. That'd be nice, but I bet they don't feed us as well. And passengers would miss displays like this. A group of people on jet skis put on a water show to break up the day. A welcome distraction with life on board, a challenge for people like Canadian Roger Maniscalco and his wife. His medication is, is out as of this evening, and so we... We put in our order when the quarantine first happened. We haven't heard anything. Um, getting a hold of anybody is very challenging. Hundreds of Canadians are stranded on two ships in Asia, and the Foreign Affairs Minister is watching the situation closely. I spoke yesterday again with the, C the group CEO of All in America uh, to make sure that we were offering all assistance to uh, Canadians on board. Uh, we're also speaking with the Japanese uh, authorities to make sure that uh, every Canadian receive all the medical attention uh, that they need. Meantime, the second Canadian charter to repatriate people stuck in Wuhan, China, is on its way back to CFB Trenton in Ontario with 185 people on board. Health officials say they will be staying separate from the first batch of evacuees. We're trying to make sure that the, their quarantine period would start when they land, where they have to have continued, so they don't have to reset the clock. So you want to make sure the two groups are not commingling. To that end, there are already designated times for evacuees on the base to enjoy outdoor air several times a day. People are really enjoying the sunshine. Late today, Canada's chief public health officer reiterated calls for Canadians to self-isolate for 14 days if they're returning from the Hubei province of China. Dr. Teresa Tam says about 70 to 80 travelers make that trip on a daily basis, and she feels it's a prudent step as this outbreak evolves. 
Donna? Okay, Mike LeCouture in Ottawa, thanks. The United Kingdom is taking aggressive new steps to try to stop the spread of the virus within its borders. There are now just eight confirmed cases in the UK, yet public health officials today declared the virus an imminent threat. Crystal Gamansing explains what that means and why officials say it's necessary. The virus has hit this medical centre in Brighton, England, where a staffer is the second British healthcare worker to contract the illness. The British government now has the power to quarantine people believed to be at risk of spreading the virus by force if necessary. It designated two isolation facilities, a hospital near Liverpool and a conference centre northwest of London. Officials say that while the virus poses an imminent threat to public health, the risk of contracting it inside the UK is moderate and they want to keep it that way. The detection of this small number of cases could be the spark that becomes a bigger fire. But for now, it's only a spark. But that spark is enough for British Airways to cancel all flights to Beijing and Shanghai until April. In an effort to calm nerves in the Chinese capital, President Xi Jinping made a show visiting clinics in a mask. He also spent time outside meeting with residents. <laughs> Let's not shake hands in this special period, he said. You should always remain confident. We will be able to contain this epidemic eventually. The WHO, for its part, has deployed a team of experts in communicable diseases led by Canadian Dr. Bruce Aylward. When asked if Chinese officials are sharing all of the information they have, the WHO's Director General pivoted away from politics. That's how we should see the threat as one humanity against a virus which we don't know very well. Dr. Bruce Aylward's team is now on the ground in Beijing and more will be joining. It's all in an effort to gain insight into this virus. Now, the Canadian doctor is a bit of a rock star in the world of epidemiology. Most notably, he led the WHO's response at the height of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Donna? All right. Crystal Gamansing in London. Thanks. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau paid a surprise visit to Canadian forces in Kuwait, making a detour there while on his trip to Africa and Europe. It's been a tense six weeks for Canadian troops there after an escalation in tensions between Iran and the U.S. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, is traveling with the Prime Minister. David? Well, Donna, this really was kind of a pitch stop for the Prime Minister. He spent about 90 minutes on the base, uh, most of that shaking hands with the troops, Canadian Forces members who are serving here as part of Operation Impact. About 650 Canadian soldiers are involved in Operation Impact, mostly in training and intelligence missions in Jordan, Lebanon and Iraq. But many of the soldiers stationed in Iraq were pulled back to Kuwait. They were trying to avoid getting caught in the crossfire when Iran fired missiles at U.S. bases in Iraq in retaliation for the killing of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani on January the 3rd. You've all had uh, a volatile past few weeks. It made for nervous family members back in Canada. Your families were certainly worried about, but all Canadians were worried about was your safety. Trudeau, in the midst of a week of travel that is taking him across Africa, told the troops the country was grateful. You step up every day, far from your loved ones, far from your families, because you believe in the values that Canada stands for. The military would not permit any on-the-record interviews with uniformed personnel Monday, but the Foreign Affairs Minister says those troops who had to be pulled out of their mission in Iraq are keen to be back at it. They want to be uh, going back to their normal duties, but obviously uh, this needs to be done in a safe environment and at the invitation of the host nation. Now, at the end of this week of travel for the Prime Minister, he's going to be in Munich, Germany, for a big defence and security conference. Lots of foreign ministers and defence experts. And it's really going to be there that we're going to have the substantive discussions about the future of peace in Iraq, about the threat in Iran, and where Canada fits in with all of that. Donna? Lots to discuss. David Aiken in Kuwait City. Thanks. As the RCMP in northern B.C. continue to enforce a court order and remove protesters opposed to a natural gas pipeline, their supporters are disrupting travel and trade elsewhere in the country. For a fifth day, many via rail services between Ontario and Quebec were blocked. Supporters of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chief set up on a key CN rail line near Belleville, Ontario, leaving many travellers stranded. 21 services between Montreal and Toronto and between Ottawa and Toronto were cancelled because of the blockade. 
Since Thursday, more than 100 via rail trains have been canceled and more than 16,000 passengers affected. CN Rail has been granted a court injunction to remove the protesters. Via says its trains will not operate until the issue is resolved. What do we do? And early this morning, dozens of supporters of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs were arrested in Vancouver after a B.C. court granted an injunction to remove them. They've been blocking access to Canada's busiest port and to Delta Port in Tawasson. It's all a show of solidarity for what's happening on a Forest Service road in northern B.C. RCMP are enforcing a B.C. Supreme Court injunction to clear protest camps there so coastal gas link workers can build a $6 billion natural gas pipeline. Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs maintain no pipelines can be built through their territory without their consent, though elected chiefs have consented. Today, protesters say the RCMP made more arrests. And on the future of another pipeline, the Trans Mountain expansion from Alberta to, to B.C., the federal government is launching a new round of consultations. Finance Minister Bill Morneau says up to 129 Indigenous communities will be engaged to ensure they have what he calls a direct economic stake in the project. This next step will be focused on different models of economic participation, such as equity-based or revenue sharing options and will seek to build mo momentum towards a widely acceptable option for the groups that we're consulting with. Several Indigenous-led groups are interested in buying the pipeline. The talks will also explore whether participating communities are prepared to work together through an existing entity or a new one. Morneau says the government will profit when it sells the Trans Mountain pipeline, despite the 70% increase in construction costs estimates announced last week. A major data breach in Israel coming up, how the personal information of millions of voters was exposed. Four members of the Chinese military have been charged by the U.S. with hacking the credit monitoring agency Equifax. It happened in 2017, and it was one of the largest data breaches in American history. The personal data of nearly 150 million people, including 19,000 Canadians, was compromised, including social security numbers and addresses. The American Attorney General says China has a voracious appetite for Americans' personal information. Our cases reveal a pattern of state-sponsored computer intrusions and thefts by China targeting trade secrets and confidential business information. Hackers were able to exploit a security flaw to obtain login information. They're also suspected of wiping logs in an effort to cover their tracks. None of the four Chinese men charged are in custody and officials admit there's little chance they'll face trial in the U.S. The RCMP says it's aware of the FBI investigation and is prepared to help upon request. There's been a serious security lapse involving an app that promoted Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his Likud party. It exposed the personal information of six and a half million Israeli voters. The app is used for campaign management. Prime Minister Netanyahu's party reportedly uploaded the entire national voter registry to it, but failed to secure personal details. It exposed voters' names, identification numbers, phone numbers and addresses, raising fears about identity theft and foreign interference. No hacking skills were even required to see it. Cybersecurity officials across the world have warned new technology is best kept out of the hands of election officials and political parties. Israelis go to the polls in March, the third time in less than a year. The little state of New Hampshire is in the political crosshairs in the U.S. tonight. The first Democratic primary of 2020 takes place there tomorrow. It's all about choosing a candidate who can beat President Trump in November. And this is shaping up to be an unpredictable race. Our Jackson Prosco is in New Hampshire tonight. Jackson? Donna, there's a clear sense that things here are shifting. And in many cases, voters seem less bound to one specific candidate and more interested in picking the person they think is best positioned to win. In Plymouth, New Hampshire, they trudge through the snow to hear from a political phenomenon. Pete Buttigieg, the 38-year-old former mayor, won the Iowa caucuses and is surging in New Hampshire polls. This is a moment for bringing as many people as we can into the picture. Curiosity is growing. Mayor Pete, as they call him, pitches himself as a moderate, claiming to be less extreme than Bernie Sanders, yet more progressive than Joe Biden. 
but a picture where your only choices are between a revolution or the status quo is a picture where most of us don't see ourselves. The strategy has worked. His rallies have a knack for drawing in undecided voters. What are you curious to hear from Pete Buttigieg? Um, I guess I just want to really see uh, the passion, the fire for the position. I don't want to vote for like someone who has like no chance. If Buttigieg does well in New Hampshire, it could very much hurt the chances for Joe Biden. I have enormous experience. Whose campaign is now hoping to recover from a disastrous performance in Iowa while holding the line here. Character is on the ballot. The character of this country is on the ballot. We have a big thing tomorrow. Amy. In recent days, Senator Amy Klobuchar has seen her numbers surge too, surpassing Biden. Oh. But the biggest threat to all of them may be Bernie Sanders. We will not forget education. We will not forget teachers. A crowd favorite here, who is backed by an army of loyal supporters who may not be willing to back any other candidate. It is very critically important to me to be here for my grandchildren, for the future of this earth, for the future of children everywhere. One very likely scenario is that Sanders wins and Buttigieg finishes a strong second. That would put the squeeze on Joe Biden. And Biden's camp already senses this is a real possibility. They're now suggesting they're more interested in winning states further down the line, like South Carolina. Donna? All right, lots at stake. Jackson Prosco in New Hampshire, thanks. Ahead from floods to powerful winds, a huge storm batters Europe. Watching Global National. Pilots do train for this, but still, it's not the kind of landing anyone relishes. Flights wobbled their way into Zurich Airport as a storm battered northern Europe with gale force winds. Storm Kira has triggered multiple severe weather warnings and disrupted travel across Europe, including in Germany and France. In the UK, air, rail and ferry services are affected, and at least 200 flood warnings are in place across the country. And the storm has already caused blizzards in Scotland and northwest England. Some devastating developments in Ontario. A father and his four-year-old daughter who disappeared while on a hike on Sunday have been found dead. Police believe the pair fell from a cliff. Their bodies were found at the base of an escarpment near Milton, Ontario. The young girl has been identified by her mother and stepfather. And they tell Global News they suspect foul play is involved because the girl has been at the centre of a long custody battle. They were due back around 5.30 p.m. and when they weren't received back, uh, we got a call from a, a worried party about 7.30 p.m. that they had not um, returned. The terrain they were found in is known to be difficult. It was also raining and snowing at the time. Police say the case is not considered a homicide at this stage. Next, Oscar makes history as Parasite takes Hollywood's top prize. did such a great job in Harriet hiding black people that the Academy got her to hide all the black nominees. <laughs> That's comedian Chris Rock. He got some laughs last night at the Oscars, pointing out only one African-American actor, Cynthia Erivo, was nominated this year. She played Harriet Tubman, who escaped slavery and helped hundreds of others do the same. There was a lack of diversity this year. 19 out of the 20 acting nominees were white, and all of the nominees for Best Director were men. So many great directors nominated this year. I don't know, Chris. I, I, I thought there was something missing uh, from the list this year. Vaginas? Yeah. yeah. No. No. <laughs> that said, the Academy did make history this year. The South Korean movie Parasite dominated the night, winning four Oscars. And as Eric Sorensen explains, it beat some of Hollywood's most seasoned filmmakers. Pong Joon-ho! <laughs> It was long overdue. At a ceremony to honor the world's best motion pictures, a non-English language film finally won the top prize. It took 92 years and a South Korean movie called Parasite. A dark comedy in which a lower class family infiltrates and outwits an upper class household. <laughs> You could sense the joy and relief that Hollywood got it right, finally conceding the best film could be made far away in a different language. 
것만도 너무 영광인데 이제 상을 받을 줄 전혀 몰랐었고요. 네. When I was in school, I studied Martin Scorsese's films. Just to be nominated was a huge honor. Every year, beyond the applause and the glitter, the Academy Awards reflect Hollywood in the moment, either leading the way or lagging behind modern society's expectations. Back in 1929, there were no black acting nominees. No. And now in 2020, we got one. Yeah. Hollywood has been confronting societal change for decades. 80 years ago, Hattie McDaniel was the first African-American to win an Oscar. The ceremony held at a segregated Hollywood hotel. And yes, last night, only one person of color was nominated in the main acting categories, and she didn't win. Nowadays, the Academy seems to be in the political, cultural crosshairs every year. There was criticism that no women were nominated for Best Director again. But Hollywood has become more conscious of how it projects itself to the world, and the world still wants to bask in Hollywood's recognition. A salute from South Korea's president and applause from everyday South Koreans today. Still, leave it to the Oscars to shut off the lights during Parasite's onstage celebration. It took appeals from a star-studded audience to shame the producers to put the no-name Koreans back on camera. Hi, everybody. Even on a groundbreaking night, Hollywood can still trip over its own progress. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's your Canada is St. Nicholas on Prince Edward Island. Email your pictures to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.